So without any further ado, I'm so glad to welcome Dr. Chantal Numaki, who is the co-founder of the training organization Threshold. She holds both a bachelor's and a master's degree in clinical psychology, and she has a doctorate degree in education with a dissertation focused on raising awareness to the co-parenting issues of single African-American fathers. She is a counselor and a certified parent educator who has served the Bayview Hunters Point and Alameda County communities uh -huh. for more than 30 years. She's also served as a volunteer coordinator and family support counselor supervisor on a parenting crisis hotline and a pre-service trainer for volunteers and master's level interns. I'm so glad to have you here today. This is such an incredible training. Appreciate your willingness to be here with us today. So I'll go ahead and, and uh, take it away. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me. And uh, what a wonderful introduction. Thank you. And I also want to add one of my most important jobs is to be a parent, um, a parent of two adults. I can't believe it. And I'm also a new grandparent. So it's just so wonderful um, to have um, that experience and to be able to share parenting concepts. So let me share my screen. There we go. So one thing that I say is that, you know, I love teaching but I'm not a technical person. However, I've gotten pretty good at troubleshooting <laughs> with some help. And we're so, here to back you up. Thank you, thank you. So um, as we uh, discussed, we're gonna be talking about the different styles of parenting. And you know the way that we parent our child, the way we interact with our children, not only influences their development, but their personality, their behavior, the way they interact with the world, the way they feel that they belong in the family. And, but we're not static. We're not static beings. We're fluid. We continue to grow as we're in relationship to our environment, our experiences, and our own development. So the concepts that we're gonna be talking about today, some might resonate with you, but also be, feel free to take what you need and maybe leave what you might not need for later, right? So talking about building our toolbox, we don't use every tool in a toolbox, but we know that it's there in case we want to use it in case um, we face different experiences. So as we talked about, um, uh, you probably received this, we're gonna have an icebreaker and then discuss the factors that can influence parenting styles. We'll have a break and then explore the four major parenting styles uh, and their possible effects on children's feeling of belonging and interaction with the world? And how do we support clients in implementing different parenting practices? Well, I invite you to have questions, comments, and feedback throughout our time together, but we definitely will have time at the end. So please, if you have a good memory, you know, memorize what you're gonna ask questions about, but also I invite you to have pen, paper, just to write things down so that you're not frustrated. Like, wait, what was that I was trying to say? What was that I was going to say? Okay. And learning objectives to differentiate between the four major styles of parenting that we're gonna be focusing on and to be able to identify the effect that each parenting style can have on children and also to identify two or three factors that can influence the way that children are raised. So like Beth had said, group agreements, uh, be respectful of each other. We might hear something that might be different. I invite you to open up your perspective and maybe invite like, you know, I, I know what I think. I never thought of it that way. 
So it might not, we might not agree with what each other uh, might be sharing, but we can open up our experience and learn a different perspective. Cell phones, as always, put on vibrate or silent, but please take a call because you might have other obligations to touch base, but come back, okay? Um, and then if people decide to disclose something personal in the community or in the break rooms, make sure to keep that information confidential. Keep it here so people feel safe and an equal voice for all participants. Thank you for talking about your camera, um, Beth being on or off. So I invite you again, like Beth said, however you feel comfortable, this is your space. Right. People are so kind and they always say to me, oh, I don't want you to feel alone. I want you to be able to see my face. I just want to say this is your space. I just love sharing information. Right. I know that you're here. I can feel your presence and it's OK. So I ask you to reflect on the information we're going to talk about. To share in the chat if you feel comfortable or to share verbally. It's up to you. This is your space. And it's all right to remain in reflection and listen, right? Either option. Is there anything that needs to be added to our list for you to feel more comfortable in working together today? Okay. That wasn't your last chance. <laughs> if something comes up, please let us know. Okay. So let's begin with our opening activity. I invite you to take a minute and reflect on the following questions. So do you think the way you were raised and or the environment you grew up in influence the way you raise your children? And if so, how? And also in addition, if you don't have your own children, how might that influence the way you would raise them? Or are you influenced, um, you have children in your circle, friends, family, how do you think that environment impacts them? Okay, so pause for a moment and consider that. Any feedback? And again, you can express yourself or write something in the chat. Okay. So for example, what I'm uh, thinking of is sometimes the environment. So if you were maybe in a city environment growing up, maybe there's a lot more rules about safety, right? Or if you are um, maybe had health issues, maybe your parent had health issues, they might, it might interfere with attachment because maybe they had a hard time being present because of illness or maybe had to be in a hospital and maybe weren't there. Okay, so those kinds of- A lot of good comments in the chat. I don't know. Oh, I can't know. see it. Yeah, so someone said, um, Thank you. Yes, I try, I try to do mostly different than what my parents did. Okay. Uh, someone said, um, It's what we know. We grow up now knowing um, and think it's okay or normal. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like people are really maybe doing some things differently. Sometimes a reaction to parent style going to the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So authoritarian versus permissive. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. Yeah, so a lot of good comments. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for highlighting that. I, somehow I can't see them, but thank you for highlighting them. Thank you. So keeping those in mind, and we're going to explore um, various aspects of all those comments. So thank you. Thank you. So what can influence a person's style of parenting? So parenting is a complex process where parents and children both impact each other, right? So in Diana Lang's book, 
parenting and parent diversity issues. She highlights three major factors to consider in what affects a person's parenting style. Number one, the characteristics of the parents, right? Number two, the characteristics of the children and also the context and the social cultural characteristics that they are raising or being raised in. So keep those in mind as we explore. Let's start with characteristics of parents. So let's start with age and look at those happy faces. <laughs> wow, there's a lot of different parenting, a lot of different parents, caregivers. So let's start with age. So how does age affect the way you parent? Where are you developmentally? How old are you, right? That could affect energy level. It could affect uh, finances. Are you kind of stable in your career? Are you changing, right? What are your responsibilities? How about gender identity? How does that influence? Do you accept or consciously or unconsciously social stereotypes, right? Um, how does that play out in your, uh, your parenting style? So for example, my oldest son, uh, he is decides that decide to be a stay at home father. So, wow. So with that, that really kind of shakes the stereotypes of parents and who should stay home and who shouldn't. So his parenting, he has to consider explaining a lot, right? And maybe being a little bit more defensive and, you know, this is what I'm going to do, right? So how about personality? What is your temperament? What is your personality as a parent? Are you easygoing? Are you structured, right? That has an effect or are you sensitive, right? So I think about um, sensitivity to noise. Maybe you have to have a quiet household or smells, right? So it might influence what you do with your children. So just thinking about your personality and temperament. Beliefs. What are your beliefs? How does that affect parenting? Do you believe that children should obey parents and maybe not make decisions? Or do children do all the dirty work? <laughs> I say that with an attitude because that's the way I was raised, doing all the dirty work, mowing the lawn, cleaning up after pets. So what are your beliefs around parents and children? Or how about your knowledge about parenting, right? Do you have past experience with children, babysitting, or maybe you're the oldest sibling and have to take care and have a lot of experience with younger children, or maybe your professional experience. Maybe you work in child care, child development. And then as I mentioned during the opening, what is your mental and physical health? and how that can affect. Hospitalizations can take you away from your child and affect attachment, and or even if you're home and just not feeling well, I'm talking about holistic health, physical, mental, emotional, how can that affect your presence with your child? And then personal history, and I also want to talk about um, your life history. So not just um, childhood, but everything leading up to the present moment, including your childhood and your experiences. So how does that affect your um, parenting? So thinking about trauma, past trauma, how that could play a role in safety and what you allow your child to do and what you don't allow your child to do. And as people said during 
the opening, sometimes we use our parenting as a reference point, right? Even if we don't like the way we were parented, it could still be a reference point saying, I will never do that, right? Or yes, I will do that or certain aspects. And sometimes we tend to practice what we've seen, right? Even if we didn't like it. Sometimes we might say, you know, I'll never say that as a, um, as a parent, but times of, of stress, especially, you might say the exact thing. Like I remember when my mom said, I'm not made out of money. And I was like, that's a crazy thing to say. I know that you're not. And then blurt, I said the same thing. <laughs> Can't believe it. So especially during stress and thinking about what's going on with example, migration, immigration. My parents were first uh, immigrated from the Caribbean. And so I'm the first generation. And so that's a historical piece and a lot of influence on how they parented me here in the United States. And then the overarching current health situation, right? COVID quarantines that can affect parenting with safety that we never had to even think about, right? And health spacing. Um, and then also with violence, right? Asian violence, um, uh, the violence that's erupting around or erupt, uh, around Black Lives Matters. So just thinking about how trauma can affect parenting. Okay, to and your life history. So let's stop for a moment and consider those aspects. And again, I invite any comments along the way. It's all right. So if you can let me know if some, somebody wrote something in the chat. Thank you. You can monitor that for you. Thank you. So keeping that in mind, and let's look at the next aspect. How about the characteristics of the children in our care, right? So parenting is not just one direction, as I mentioned. So it's bi-directional. Parents affect children and the kind of child you're parenting affects the parent too, right? So it's bi-directional. So let's consider Again, gender identity. So, oh, I think I went to the next slide, hold on. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Just trying to get that technical piece. Good thing I had that disclaimer. So gender identity. So starting with that. So again, what are some of the conscious or unconscious ideas about how to raise uh, the children in our care, different genders. Some parents might think that some uh, roles are for boys, for girls. So for example, might encourage girls to knit, <laughs> crochet, and maybe some chores around the house, maybe encourage boys to take on, such as mowing, right? Mowing the lawn or uh, birth order, right? So there's different expectations that can happen consciously or, or subconsciously with the order of the way your children are born. There can be expectations for older children that might be different from younger children. Younger children might get away with some aspects that older children might not get away with. And then thinking about temperament, that's a big impact on how children can be raised. So children arrive with specific characteristics, the way they relate to the world. And so let's say you have a baby that has high sensitivity and expressiveness, and maybe they're more cranky a parent might feel ineffective 
right? I can't, I don't know what to do with this child, as opposed to a child that might be easy to soothe, right? The, the parent can feel more effective and in turn have more smiles, more connecting, okay? Health issues. So in thinking about health issues and health status of children, that could affect their, uh, their ability. And that um, can also affect parenting in maybe your child might have special needs. Then there might be medications involved, side effects to those medications, doctor's appointments, and more attention and more um, collaboration, right? And more um, scheduling. And then also trauma. So children with a history of trauma can impact by how the parent understands the impact of trauma and how it could affect their child, okay? So let's pause here. Any reflections on what we talked about or anything that you might add? And that also goes for the characteristics of the parent. Um, I know you mentioned birth order, but something that comes to mind is also age. Like some people might be better at comforting an infant. Some people might do better with teenagers. Yes. Um, and that's definitely something I think that maybe even with the same child, like over time, the relationships might change based on like age changes, you know, puberty mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, um, yeah, that's another aspect birth order, but age, some people say, you know, I just, I just love babies, but then babies don't stay babies forever, right? So what happens when they get older, right? So yeah, thank you for considering that too. Anything else? Okay. So let's look at the last, um, the last impact. So, so, so how children are raised, right? Relationships don't just happen in a vacuum, okay? So um, it's not in isolation. So we're affected by the context and uh, the social cultural aspect of what's happening. So let's start with social support. So raising children, you know, it's not easy. And it's difficult, especially if you are raising children alone without other adult support. That saying, it takes a village, is a wise saying because it's harder and your challenges can be um, exponentially um, highlighted if you don't have other adult support. And then thinking about religion. So we can be guided by the teachings of religious beliefs. The Bible says this, the Quran teaches this way, and that can influence expectations and how we raise, um, what's, uh, what rules we apply to our children. And then culture, well, that's a big one, right? So culture has many elements that can impact parents. So for example, immigration, right? So immigration and disparity between immigrants and their children that are born here, right? So that can play out in so many different ways. As I mentioned, being first generation from parents that grew up in island nations in Haiti and St. Vincent, and then going, you know, the Immigration pattern is usually New York. So going from that island to the big city, that made some differences, some challenges with strictness and safety. And then also talking about back home, right? That was something that happened a lot. And as I talked to other people of immigrants, there was always that back home reference. Back home, we did it this way. Back home, we did it that way. And to me, that was a little confusing. Like, I thought this was home, right? What's back home like? 
So it's almost having foot your foot in two doors always. And then that could also affect your goals for your children. So maybe back home, the culture kind of uh, highlighted an aspect that might be different in the culture you're in now. So it could be a difference of um, wanting uh, how independent you want your children to be, right? Or do you want them to be more community centered? Or maybe parents don't decide, maybe grandparents decide major issues. So that can all affect. So there's some universal characteristics that people do want for their children, but also culture can influence how that's played out. So people might say, you know, I want my children to be successful, but what does that mean in your particular culture? It can mean education. It can mean get a good job. It could mean to take care of uh, elder members of your family. So it could look different. So consider that. Then as I mentioned before, your place of residence, that has a big um, um, effect. So living in a big city, again, things are busy. There's more people, there's more dangers. So there might be stricter rules as opposed to living in a rural community, right? Maybe on a farm where children might be able to drive earlier and also have responsibilities of taking care of animals, even before they go to school. And then financial situation. So financial situation could look different in different families, but in, if there's financial hardship, that could add a lot of pressure. Maybe having multiple jobs to make ends meet, and that can mean absence away from relating and being present in your family. And also can lead to frustration, depression, sadness, and that can impact the way that you parent. And I put this as isms, right? So there's so many different isms. And what I'm basically talking about and highlighting is the impact of oppression and privilege right? How that can influence your parenting. So for example, I remember um, my eldest son, again, we were, we were in um, a public setting, we were at church and in the play area. So he picked up a doll and was playing with the doll. And this father shouted like across the room, put that down, right? Hmm. So that pressure and the impact of culture, maybe it was homophobia or wanting to put my son in a box of what boys should be like as opposed to girls, that could influence how you parent. So the parent I am, I assertive, and I said, you know, what's the problem, right? I said, I, I would like my son to be a good father one day. Of course he could play with dolls, right? So again, how that plays out. And then also thinking about oppression and privilege, you know, we might not fit into one or the other box, right? So there was an experience that we just had in um, Sonora County, there was a demonstration of people that seemed like they had maybe um, Confederate flags and had, um, expressing different, uh, expressing extreme views. And my son and I were walking down the street and my son now is 6'4", he really stood out. And so I felt really protective of him, even though he is an adult and you know he's bigger than me, but I felt protective of him. So that oppression, right? Being a certain ethnic group and uh, demonstration felt very threatening, but the privilege piece was that I knew we had a car, right? So we could escape. So what if there were um, 
different situations. So in one case, I was oppressed, but in the other case, we had privilege that we could get out of there. Okay. So think about how that impacts parenting and what options you have and what options you might not based on the isms. And the last is school. So thinking about if a choice is possible, right? Sometimes we can take our children to different neighborhoods based on if we have the time, the energy, the resources, but how much influence does school have on your child? And it's a major part of their day, even if they're online, right? And thinking about now they're going back to school, what impact does that have on children? What does a school provide? What about safety? And what about involvement as a parent? Is it expected or is it discounted, right? So I remember there was um, some school, a school, my children went to an alternative type school and it, um, some teachers expected you to be involved and use your strengths. And some people, um, some teachers were like, yeah, you could, you join, but you know, I don't, I don't want to hear any input, right? So what's discounted? Are your strengths highlighted or not? Anything else to add to these social um, context characteristics or any feedback? Feel free to write it in the chat or you can also unmute yourself. Thank you for that reminder. Okay. So again, hold that thought and you will get a chance. If anything comes to mind about anything that we talked about so far that you wanna add, but um, let me know at any time, but also let's just stop. And I invite you to pause and really reflect about what we talked about. So you can choose one of these prompts or choose something that comes to mind. So what's something that you noticed as we talked about characteristics of parents, children, and context? What's something that you might have remembered? What's something that you learned? How about if it reminded you of the way I was raised or those who raised me, the way I was raised. And then later we're gonna bridge more into clients. The way my clients, right? Or any other prompt that you think of. And I invite you to write it down. And this is in preparation to reflect, but also our next step. Okay, so let me give you a couple of minutes to write something down. Let's see, it's 10.38. I will check back with you in 10.39 to see if you need more time. Okay, does anybody need more time? There's with anybody, a, oh, go ahead. There's a reflection about um, being raised in a Christian principle um, and then raising uh, their own children with a bit more balance. So um, okay. I, yeah, so it looks like people are putting some comments in the chat already. Okay, thank you, thank you. So thank you for highlighting them again. Thank you for writing in the chat. Um, I don't know, how come I can't see it, but thank you for letting me know. Anything else? Maybe we can look at a couple more comments in the chat.
I, I, this is Beth. I didn't put anything in the chat, but I can say that I raised my children different. I was a, than I was raised, um, really was able to, I was an older parent, so waited to learn a little bit more about children and childhood and raising them before I had my own kids. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oh, and there's some great comments. Um, I was raised by immigrants and first generation too. Acculturation process changes so many things about the way I want to raise my kids versus the way I was raised. Mm -hmm. um, another one raised by a single mom, authoritarian and negligent style. So um, yeah, I that, that there are, that's a, not unusual for mm -hmm. us. Uh, someone else said something I noticed is parents receive a lot of blame, but they're mm -hmm. just part of the puzzle. This is so right. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Yeah, it's the toughest job. Mm -hmm. It is. Thank you. Thank you for those comments and reflecting. So again, this first part is reflecting on, you know, our parenting or our impact with children and then we'll talk about how to bridge that with our clients. But the main thing is to feel how it feels ourself to consider what goes into, what impacts parenting styles. Okay, so thank you. So now that we have our, our juices going, let's go into our next section, which is, uh, will involve the breakout room. So again, you pause, right? And maybe reflecting on what you wrote before, but also choose and write and be prepared to share if you are comfortable. So again, you could talk about what you reflected on before, but could expand. So these factors influence the way I was raised. These factors influence how I raise my children or the children I come in contact with. Or it seems to me that these factors influence the way my clients raise their children. Okay. So consider those. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Someone was trying to say something. I can't hear you. Can you repeat that? Not sure if Patricia, if you were trying to say something. Not sure. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, I'm sorry we couldn't hear you. So please repeat it or if you can write it in the chat. So we're going to be uh, invite you uh, to share within the breakout rooms. So this will be um, about a four minute share. And there should be two people per breakout room. And then, go ahead. And um, share if you you know feel comfortable. What maybe what prompt sticks out stands out for you, or if there's something else that comes to mind, and share about how parenting styles yours, your clients can be impacted by those different aspects that we just covered. Okay. Well, um, I, are, is everyone back now? Yes, we have okay. the rooms are closed. Oh, thank you. So yeah, thank you for sharing. I love our room too. So again, it, there was a little bit of what room, who room. So if you didn't have a chance to share, um, I just ask you if you want to share now, but um, just any reflections if um, you have, that you feel comfortable sharing about those props, about what we talked about so far. Uh, and we have, a, you know, we could take a few comments if you feel comfortable sharing about your experience. So maybe not what someone else said, um, but what did you experience, okay? There were a couple of things in the chat, I'll just say. Um, let's see, the, um, the way I react to my two-year-old, 
but I fight it. So it sounds like there's a way that this person reacts to their two-year-old, but they fight it because I want to be my own individual self. <clears throat> I would raise my daughter the same. And I'm not sure if I'm getting it right, Evelyn. So if you wanted to unmute and say something, please, you're welcome to. Um, I think what I mean is um, the way that I was raised, uh, I was raised by my grandma mm -hmm. and, you know, she's very old school. I was sharing this with my group. Um, she gave me a lot of culture, you know, experience, which was my favorite part of it. You know, um, I, had a lot of, I grew up with a lot of cousins and um, just learned about, you know, I'm from South America. So my, so my culture is embedded in me and the food and um, just everything. Um, I was also around a lot of um, religion, which I didn't really care for that much because I was just a kid, you know, I just, yeah, it was just too much. It was too much for me. I, uh, and, uh, but she was, um, again, she was old school. So she was really um, hard on me with discipline. And I think somebody said something about um, kids. We blame parents a lot. And I think it's because, you know, as a kid, you know, I used to be really angry at my parents for, um, for leaving me with my grandma, mm. you know, I think that's what the other person maybe thinks though. I mean, you were saying that for, and I, and, um, because, um, uh, before my own personal therapy, I, um, I, I was very angry towards my parents because of that. Mm -hmm. And before I had a kid, you know, I had to prepare myself, um, have my own therapy. That's why I waited so long. I mean, I'm I'm a I'm, I, I just have a two year old and and I'm in my thirties and um so it's really hard because sometimes I feel like I done all the work with my therapist, but she triggers me a lot. You know, she f brings a lot of old feelings, even though I'm not my grandma, I'm not my mom, I'm not my my dad. Um, it's when I fight it. That's what I meant. Like I fight those feelings, you know, when I get triggered um, because I don't want to re react the way that they did. I don't want to say the things that they said. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. And so, you know, we're going to talk about to changing or adding to your parenting toolbox and definitely, um, you know, getting support, being conscious is the first step that, you know, I wanna make a change and then getting some support, like you had said, you know, if we, um, if we broke our hand or hurt our foot, we wouldn't hesitate to go to the doctor for our physical challenges. The same for our mental and our emotional health, right? So if we find something that we need some support, why not seek holistic health and get the emotional and mental health too, to help us through all challenges so we can have the total holistic health package, not just physical. So thank you. Thank you. And again, um, you know, being triggered. So like someone had said about parenting being the way we were parented being a reference point, even if we want to make a change, it's still that point of reference because you know, we could say parenting, this is what you do. But a lot of us, we, we have in our hearts what we saw, right? And when we're triggered, those same tapes play, right? So to know that, wow, you know, when I'm triggered, I want to go here and you can consciously choose. It's not easy, but you can choose the direction and more and more you can go that way. So not expecting perfection, but there's progress. Thank you. And also, wait, one more comment <laughs> that really got me, wanted to talk. So also what, what someone said about blaming. So, you know, thank you uh, for bringing that up again, because sometimes, you know, there's a lot of pressure on parents, a lot of pressure for perfection that can't happen, right? And with information, you could do different things, right? So talking about the way our, we were parented with the information they had and the circumstances they had, maybe that's what they chose. But with more information, we could do different things. 
or maybe they didn't even realize they have a choice, right? So not a lot of opportunities to, to talk about parenting styles like we're doing, what, right? So you just parent the way you were parented, right? You, you're together over the dinner table holidays and this is what you do, right? So a lot of times generations repeated behaviors, even if people are like, mm, I don't know if I really want that, but maybe they, were, they didn't realize they had options. And now we know that we can choose. Okay, so thank you for highlighting those aspects. Looks like there's somebody has their hand up. Fiandra, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you. No, no it's more like a comment. Hi, good morning to you all. Um, I just was thinking about even as she was, Ms. Chantel was speaking, um, I think about how um, we didn't, we weren't raised um, to explore and be free, right? But we were raised mm -hmm. in fear. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I thought about that because, you know, I think about, I have my own five children and I got three that are adults and then I have two that I'm still raising, you know, in school age. And I said, you know, they don't, you know, like the, how dare they do these things? If my mother, if I would have did this with my mom. I, and then I stopped one day and I thought about it and I said, I feared my mom. Mm -hmm. So that's why I didn't do a lot of the things uh, uh, you know, that they do. And it's not like they're out there raising havoc and doing all these, but it's the small things of talking to them and saying, hey, go clean up your room. Okay. And then they don't clean it up. And then we don't have no consequence. You know, we would have been beat up if we didn't clean up our room when, when stated. So I just would like to add that we are definitely seen as the weaker uh, parents because we don't attack. Uh, we don't uh, raising fear. I know I don't raise in fear. You know, I raise for understanding. I raise for them to talk and explore their own emotions because our emotions were shut down through fear. So, uh, you know, I just thought I'd share, share that out as well. But you brought something mm -hmm. up that kind of sparked that um, idea. And I said, oh, yeah, for sure. Raised mm -hmm. in fear. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that definitely was a tactic, right? And thinking about too, some of the context of that, right? So just in my own example, having um, immigrants coming to a big city from island nations and um, to further disclose why they came to um, America was mainly to escape um, intimate partner abuse, right? So coming here, a single mom, right, my, um, thinking about my grandmother on my mother's side with uh, children had to protect and had experience being um, traumatized by intimate partner abuse and having to protect against that. So it's like, you need to do what I say. And then that fear still comes out, not knowing maybe, not knowing how to deal with it right? Knowing that it's there, but what do you do with it? You know, again, people didn't have these conversations mostly, right? Especially um, not, um, uh, it's mainly, you know, with, within family. So that could get uh, passed down unless you say, I'm going to stop this, right? And have the courage to do something. But the first step is realizing it. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So fear can really keep us in check as a benefit, but what's the consequence? What's the cost? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting that. Any last comments before we go on a break? Um, there was a comment. Someone said that, and it's similar to what you were just saying, that um, um, parents weren't taught how to express love in a gentle way. And there's all kinds of reasons, and you've talked about them, um, Chantal. So, thank yeah, thank you. Yeah, so again, you know, some of the thoughts too, like, I better be hard on my child because they're going to have a hard environment, and I'd rather them get it from me than get hurt with someone else. So, sometimes that is a thought that is perpetuated. So, again, that could be a difference between aggressive and assertive. A lot of people didn't know that there's a middle ground, right? It was either you're aggressive or you're passive. But what about assertiveness? So again, um, 
bringing in those new ideas that again, people did the best of what they did know. And now we can make changes based on what we know and we can share information because information can be empowering that you have a choice. And did you know there are other options, right? So thank you for highlighting those points. So with that, note, is this a good time to take a short break? Okay. So we'll take a five minute break. Please stretch, be take care of back yourselves. At a, be back at 1108. 11, thank you, thank you for highlighting the time. So I'll see you back at 1108, thank you. So welcome back from our break. Just wanna check and see if people are here. So again, thank you uh, for your uh, reflections. And if there's any uh, leftover comments, maybe from the break, maybe people didn't get a chance, just wanna open up for a couple comments, questions or feedback. Looks like we're good. Okay, thank you. So let's move on. Let me see here. That was the break. So let's move on to an exercise. And this exercise is gonna have three parts. So this is part one. What I'd like you to do is make a list of the characteristics that you want your children to have when they're adults. So again, your children, maybe children in the future or children in your, um, in your environment. What kind of characteristics will we like our children to have? Some people might think about being honest, caring, generous, a leader, for example. So let me give you a couple of moments to think about that. Do you want them to put the in the chat? Should Maybe they could put some highlights. Okay. Right. So let's, let's think about that for a couple of minutes. And if you feel comfortable to share some in the chat, please do so. Thank you. Someone said um, to have boundaries mm. and, be, and be assertive, kindness, empathy, persevering, mm. creative, caring, capable, independent. Wow. People yeah. are such fast typists. <laughs> Thank you yeah. for helping me with it. Sure. Loyal, honest, caring, spiritual, open minded, understanding, um, integral, loving, resilient, compassionate, confident. All right, y'all going to be my parents. All right. <laughs> um, That's beautiful. Caring, kindness. Oh, man, great kids. Independent. Oh, there's wonderful things coming in. Um, establish boundaries with me as the parent and feel that their parent is a safe place. Wow, that's mm, That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you for sharing. And if it's there's something that maybe you didn't put in your list, please feel free to borrow this. Like you said, Beth, this is, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. And I've been trying to write some of them down. <laughs> well, we you. can make a copy of the chat and then actually include that in the stuff we send oh, out because it's, it's a nice reminder of what that is. we want. Thank you, thank you. So, um, so again, keeping that in mind, okay? So keeping that in mind as we explore some of the major um, parenting styles that we're gonna highlight, okay? So, When we think about styles of parenting, we're gonna focus on four major parenting styles that people kind of mentioned throughout, but that developmental psycholo um, psycho psychologists worldwide tend to highlight. And we're gonna focus on the combination of demand, right? So high demand, firm, versus low demand and receptive and supportive. So less receptive 
versus more receptive. And that's a nice way to think about styles of parenting, especially how to gain balance as we start to choose what parenting style do we want to fit into. So with authoritarian, parents have high demands with little support. With indifferent or neglectful type of parenting style, parents have low demands and low support. With a democratic responsible parenting style, and this could be called democratic, it's also called authoritative, right? It has a lot of names. Parents have high expectations and high support. And with permissive or indulgent parenting styles, parents might have low demands, but high support, okay? So again, it's nice to wrap our mind around the different styles, um, but knowing that nobody fits into a box <clears throat> perfectly 24 hours. But this is where we tend to fall. So let's explore each. Ooh, let's start with authoritarian and people kind of highlighted that one. That can be characterized as very demanding and little support, unreceptive. And a catchphrase can be because I say so, okay? Some people have said this and I've heard this in different classes as like old school parenting. So some common uh, aspects of this style is demand obedience and respect, strict rules and punishment, one way direction of communication from me to you, that's it. And can show little or not much affection. So again, parents can have high expectations and offering children little support. They might believe you do what I say, not what I do. Or the goal is obedience and respect with strict punishment if rules are broken or not followed. And they can value uh, achievement, order, discipline, and self-control. Okay, so again, some characteristics, but how could this affect children that are raised in this style, um, that when parents tend to raise in this style? They could feel insecure, maybe have few social skills, maybe even have antisocial behavior, poor self-regulation, maybe even low self-esteem, right? And those might be a little um, on the negative side. Other sides can, they can follow rules, right? But again, what's the cause? What's the effect on children? So, they might be irritable, maybe temperamental, maybe apprehensive or fearful of authority figures, maybe not feeling that they can go to someone if they made a mistake or if they need help or support that maybe they should know and they don't know. Um, they could be vulnerable to stress or maybe even apathetic or they can associate obedience and success would be loved. Okay. So think about that. And again, I'm always open to anything you want to add, but I'm just highlighting and summarizing. So the next parenting style we're going to focus on can be called indifferent, neglectful parenting style. And that's a combination of undemanding, undemanding unresponsive, low demand and low support. Catchphrase can be, I just really don't care. So characteristic might be not involved, absent, little affection, attention or guidance, lack of responsiveness to what the child might need and doesn't really implement any rules. So they might don't want to sacrifice their needs 
for their children's. They could be indifferent, contemptuous, derogatory, or completely negligent. I just really don't care. So for example, let's say if a child had an accomplishment and maybe got an A on their test, a common response of someone that falls in this style might be, okay, all right. So maybe with an infant, it could mean not meeting their basic needs, food, sleep, shelter. With toddlers, it can mean not looking out for safety hazards, not filtering what's set around a child, not screening what the child might be exposed to or filtering out individuals. They might allow anyone around their child or anyone to care for their child without really knowing, right? With school-age children, maybe not participating in their activities, not really having time or family life or maybe not even you know, thinking about what they're looking at on the internet, who cares, attitude. So how can this affect children? Wow, you know, they might seem really mature and really independent, but it could be because they have to be, right? So they have to take care of things of themselves and maybe even siblings. They might feel isolated. Right? Look at this, the image here. This boy is on his knees with his hands out. The parents just don't care. So they might feel isolated. They can have low self-esteem or low ambition because maybe they feel that they're not worth the effort. Maybe they're not worth being taken care of. Why even try? So they could also, again, see mature but they could also rebel and maybe adapt negative values or maybe attach to inappropriate role models and to replace their absent parents. So they might just attach to whoever shows attention. Oh, yes. And it might not be in their best interests. Um, they might have difficulty regulating themselves emotionally, forming healthy, trusting relationships with others due to their connect, their poor connection with their caregivers, right? So the way we connect with our children informs how they connect with the world. Okay, so think about that for a moment. Now, Let's look at permissive. So that style can be seen as not demanding, but very supportive, right? So look at this lady begging the child, right? So whatever you want can be the catchphrase. No firm rules or expectations. Parent might have a hard time saying no to their child. There's open communication. But the parent doesn't really direct the child. The child decides on may, many decisions, many important decisions that might be above what they can um, decide upon. So again, they can be affectionate or even lax, right? Inconsistent with discipline and guidance. They might be more like a friend than a parent, right? Or they might want to be more like a friend and not enforce rules because they don't want to upset their child. They might not show kids what's socially expected behavior, right? And they might tend to fulfill all of their children's wish, wishes and give in frequently. Maybe they might know the rules threaten what to do, but they have difficulty following up or setting consequences. And again, difficulty saying no. So how can that affect children, right? It might even sound like, wow, they got it made, right? But they could be impulsive 
have a hard time with social conduct because they might not know the rules. They might feel, again, unimportant. And maybe they're not important enough to be taught what's right and what's wrong. Right? I had a, some people in my classes saying that, like they felt like, how come their parents didn't take time to set limits with them? Maybe they just weren't that important. They could have a low toleration for frustration, right? Because parents can zoom in and rescue them. And they could be very dependent on the parent. They might expect instant gratification in the outside of the family world, right? And be hard to get along because they're not used to adults treating them and giving them consequences and letting them work it out. And um, again, they might be dependent, manipulative, or expect being helped with, with um, major aspects of their life, which could result in being aimless and might not know which direction to go. Because again, they're in charge and they're just children. Now, again, thinking about that style. So democratic parenting, and again, that has many different um, definitions where I like democratic, respectful parenting. And a nice way to think about this style is parents with authority. So high demand, but high support. And a catchphrase can be, hey, let's talk about this. So some characteristics can be firm, but affectionate and having empathy for what the child might be going through. High expectations, but open two-way communication. Guidance and offer consequences and helping the child reflect and learn about why this might be, why this rule is important. So this kind of parenting strikes a balance between firm, warm, supportive, and discusses rules, expectations, and why consequences have, um, can happen as a family, but is clear about who is in charge. Discipline is usually shown through coaching, guiding, utilizing natural and logical consequences and holding the child accountable for what is expected, right? And in a way that can be repeated. So solving problem solving through assertiveness. So the child can use those same skills in the outer world too. Affectionate and tends to, um, to the emotional needs of their children with reasonable boundaries and exchange of views as the child develops. They listen to their children, validate and considers their emotions. They're present and they are involved in their children's interests and activities. So with babies, this could look like creating a feeding, sleeping schedule, but making adjustments as needed based on what seems to work best for their little one. With toddlers having non-negotiable rules about health, safety, like no biting, no throwing toys, and enforce them with logical and respectful consequences, like taking the toy away if it's thrown, or reading to a child but saying good night when it's time for bed, instead of just reading and reading and reading and feeling guilty um, if the child goes to sleep so late. Offering options to explore and to fail and make decisions and support them in that failure and how to learn from the mistake. Democratic parents nurture positive relationships with their children. So what's the effect of this kind of parenting style? Children can be emotionally stable, self-directed, 
think for themselves, be self-confident and be aware of social, um, social capable, so being aware of social skills. They can be happy with themselves and explore who they are and know that the parent will be there to help with boundaries and containment and support. They can be curious and self-reliant and be goal-oriented. They can have self-control and they could make decisions and face difficulties and be persistent with tasks they undertake. Again, knowing that the parent will be there to support them and guide them. So think about that style. And then I mentioned that there's four main parenting styles, but there's another style that can hover and that one's called helicopter parenting. <laughs> See that mom hovering over a child in the corner? And that can play out in, it shows up a lot of times in authoritarian type of parenting and also in permissive or indulgent. And with authoritarian, it could look like a strong control over everything the child might do. With permissive, it could look like rescuing child from difficulty, right? Again, taking control. So for example, uh, authoritarian might be like, you know, you're gonna be a doctor when you grow up without considering what the child wants or making sure that the child uh, has academic and their own personal activities that are what the, the parent wants them to do based on what that goal is gonna be. With uh, permissive or indulgent, it could look like, oh, you know, I'll make the bed for you, right? Or if a child's having a hard time with a science project, oh, I'll finish it for you, right? That rescuing. So the possible effects on a child might be, they, they expect to be helped. They expect to be defended, or they might not learn to solve challenges or experience difficulties because parents have that total control. Okay. So, let's see here. So, thinking about those styles, and let's look at some of the costs and benefits to each. So again, with authoritarian, high demand, low support, a benefit, I'm talking about benefits for parents and children, can be those kids obey those rules, right? You say jump, they say how high. But what's the cost? Fear, and someone had talked about that, right? There's a fine line between fear and mutiny. And they might not come to the parent for support, especially if they made a mistake because they might know that reaction. Or they might behave in front of the parent, but then when the parent's not around, woohoo, right, it's all good now. And also that can be really draining for the parent to have to be there controlling everything, right? How about uninvolved? So low demand, low support. The benefits, child has freedom, independence, yeah. And the parent does too. But what about the costs? The child might feel unloved. They're not important. Or difficulty establishing relationships like we talked about. And how about permissive? Low demand, but high support. Few rules, few responsibilities again, yeah. But again, the cost could be having a hard time following rules because life and society has rules and they expect others to take care of them and might not be able to tolerate frustration. And again, the parent, whew, that's a lot of energy. Democratic, respectful parenting, high demand, high support. The benefits we had talked about, responsibility, the child can internalize rules, feel grounded, be creative. 
And again, the parent is there to support and guide. But the cost could be the child could stand out in a crowd, right? So wait a minute, my parent does this, how come not yours? Hmm, I wonder why. That's the comment I heard from my own kids. <laughs> like, wait a minute, how come you don't do that? It's like, because I'm, I'm choosing a different style of parenting. Or it might take longer, right? So you're not saying jump and your child says how high. You might take time to explain what's going on. So that could take a little bit of time, but it could also be an investment. With been helicopter, some, oh, go ahead. There have been some interesting comments oh, in the sorry. chat. Um, yeah, Thank it's okay. You. Um, it said, um, someone said that they feel like they're growing up with different people that took care of them with different styles. Yes. So it was a little crazy making, I think. Um, and wondering if parents can have several different parenting styles. Mm -hmm. um, and then some comments about the authoritarian style that can lead to, like I, you kind of mentioned that the lying and sneaking around as long as I don't get caught. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. So. Yeah, so again, we're gonna talk about the, the fact that, you know, we can choose, we're not in a box, right? And we can choose based on what we want to see in our children and also stay tuned. <laughs> so helicopter parenting, some of the costs and benefits, again, it could show up in authoritarian and permissive, permissive particularly benefits is that your child is under control make few mistakes because the parents make all the decisions. So the child might not discover their own abilities, who they are, and the parent might not allow that. Maybe they have um, a child that they don't know what they're capable of because everything's under control. Or they don't experience the satisfaction again of their own achievements and what they could do. So now, part two, and people are kind of alluding to that. So remember the list that you made after the break, right? So now that we talked about uh, the styles and also what research says, think about if you want your children to have those characteristics, what kind of parent do you have to be? And some people said, boy, you know, it seems like there were so many different styles and again, people don't necessarily fit into a box. But what research does show is that a style that has kindness and firmness can have the best results in the long run for children. But again, no, not everyone has a particular style 24 seven. And most of us are a combination, right? We don't fit into a box, but we do have the option to decide what we want to put into practice, right? What we would like to do, but it could be easier said than done. So democratic parenting um, kind of tends to have that kind of balance that a lot of people are looking for. But again, it can be a model to follow, not a destination, but a journey. Okay, so again, think about what kind of parent do you want to be? There's an interesting question. Oh, um, and someone asked about another style that's kind of you hear about is called conscious parenting. And then there's another one that I've heard that's like mindful parenting. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that they're... Um, they might fall under one of the four categories that you mentioned, yeah. but anyway, do you, what, what do you have to say about those? Thank you. So I've heard of that. I haven't really explored. We're, I'm focusing mainly on these four types, but mm -hmm. to me, mindful and conscious kind of sound like democratic parenting. Yeah. That's what I thought. You know, there might be some other aspects that are highlighted, you know, mindfulness basically is being in the here and now in the present, you know, there's different ways to describe mindfulness, best way I understand it. Conscious is consciously making a decision. You know, it, I don't know if that's where it falls into, but that's what it makes me think about. And definitely 
the democratic parenting style is conscious, yeah. mindful. And so it could be um, different aspects of those two. Thank you. Right. And, and I'll just mention this one other thing, because I think it's important um, that someone mentioned the yeah. fact that African-Americans experienced slavery for over 400 yes. years, mm -hmm. left our great grandparents and parents with not allowing for learning, but right. abuse. And it left our communities devastated to this day regarding destructive parenting styles, such as authoritarian and indifferent. So I, I yeah, I this is such an important topic that I'm hoping we get to have future trainings on. Mm -hmm. um, Right. There's also like an Afrocentric parenting, I've heard. I don't know much about it, but um, anyway, so mm -hmm. I'm going to come to you for more on this, Chantal. Yeah, Thank well, you, you know, the nice part about where we where this information is from, um, the author uh, talks about uh, just the people of color. So keeping all that into consideration and yes. the ethnic cross-cultural so a lot of times, yes, we had to uh, parent in a particular way for again, that time mm -hmm. and based on the trauma people were going through and now what do we need? Right. And so in empowering our children with uh, assertiveness, right? So as I mentioned that when we were in, in the face of that demonstration, my child felt safe enough to say, no, you know, I don't agree with that, no. And so that empowerment that he felt like I could say, like, I don't agree with that, right? So you're expressing yourself, I'm expressing myself mm -hmm. and know that that was built into him to be expressive, right? And that highlights this time, right? Mm -hmm. So what changes can we make? Maybe then they might not mm -hmm. have had, they couldn't be mm -hmm. very expressive in slavery, but what about okay. now? Thank right. You. Thank you. Yeah. And let me see. So thinking about that and also considering, so, you know, in considering your style, know that, you know, what's a, a style for me? There's no right way to raise your child, but considering what kind of person do you want to raise? What does research show? What are the characteristics of your child or children in your influence? In what way did, was your environment influential on you back when you were younger and now? The main point is that you can choose what kind of caretaker you want to be, but keeping those three in mind. So, So again, part three is what kind of parenting do you want to put into practice? So considering what research says, but for example, I want to be a very affectionate parent with my kids. So having to parent my children differently, my older son, when as soon as he could start talking, he was like, I don't want that. <laughs> That's too personal. What? So his preference. And then my younger son is more, yeah, you know? So I might wanna be a very affectionate parent, but it doesn't go well with both of my children or the environment. My husband grew up in um, a very like woodsy kind of rural environment. And so he wanted freedom for his kids, but here we are in the city. Now I grew up in New York, so California seems a lot more free but he grew up in Finland and it, this is, uh, uh so he might want freedom for his children, but we have to put rules because we're in an urban environment. Or let's say you want a child that, you know, you want a, your child to obey, but you have a child that asks a lot of questions. So that might be a little tricky, right? So keeping that in mind, and you can put into practice what you would like. Okay. So I do wanna leave some time for questions and comments at the end. So let's bridge to how we can include our clients 
right? So we might not blurt out, hey, you know, you want to talk about parenting styles? You might. But some kind of good leads is if your client starts talking about, how can I instill certain qualities in my children? Or my family criticizes the way I raise my kids. What do you think? Or how do I get my child to behave? Or what is the best way to raise a child? Hmm. So if those questions come, what is our job, right? Is to ask, listen, learn, inform, facilitate, not assume, right? Not decide for them or tell them what to do, but keeping in mind our mandated reporting um, obligations and safety, but really doing some inner work. Are we reacting just because they might pick a different parenting style than what we do? And remember that parents are the experts of their children. So questions you can ask yourself might be, what's important to the family I'm working with? What are their preferences? What are their beliefs? What does my body language say when they brought this up? Am I, ooh, ooh, right? What are my own triggers? Am I assuming something? Do I have some stereotypes about this family or about their decisions? How do prejudices, historical traumas, social pressures, inequalities influence this family? Right, and that kind of highlights what someone just said. How do I show this family that they are the experts of their children? Right, so how do I embody that? So each of us has a toolbox and we kind of talked about that. So the metaphor toolbox again can be used in adding to your toolbox. We each have one. Sometimes when we have a, some tools, we might want to get rid of some old tools and put some new ones in, right? We don't have to get rid of the whole thing, but we can add, build on our strengths and change tools that might not be as effective based on new information, right? So I was thinking about, you know, doing a drilling like a screwdriver and my husband came up with a what? So I might want to replace that. So instead of telling our clients, offer them the opportunity to add to their toolbox. We could talk about the possibility of adding and consider these questions. So what do they want to achieve again? What do they want to see? What do they have to sow so that they'll reap? So for example, one of the qualities I wanted for my children is independence. So I remember one time we were at an amusement park and there was a carousel type ride and the children got on and my older son, Kale, didn't want to. So that's okay, it's for fun. So I said, you know, would you like to go? Do you feel like you're gonna be safe? He says, I just don't wanna do that. So since I valued independence, I stood by his side because I was like, okay, you don't have to participate. I want him to think for himself without running into the crowd, All right? So what do you have to sow so that you reap? How were your clients raised and what impacted them as we had talked about? What will work best for their child? How could we be helpful? Did they notice something that they wanna do differently? And are they interested in receiving information about different parenting styles? So consider this a personal invitation. Have you noticed something different that you'd like to try? And you could also, it could be like a parallel process as you're going through and considering supporting your clients too. It's an invitation to try something new. We're always growing. Something's changing moving all the time. And as I said before, with new information, you could do different things. So I encourage you to continue to seek information and approach this change with responsibility 
of what you can change and not for guilt over what you didn't know in the past, right? So using this invitation for you and for clients with self-compassion, right? So building on our strengths, say, you know, I'm, I'm strong at this. I didn't know that. I never thought about that impact. Have self-compassion and it starts with us. And then we can filter that out to our, our clients. Okay. So at this time, I wanna come to an end. And I thank you for having questions and comments and feedback throughout, but I just wanna make sure you have time if there's anything else you'd like to talk about. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just say there have been some really great comments and questions people have. Um, okay. Someone said, "I and if um, if the if you want to unmute, feel free. Um, I can go ahead and read it, but I'm also happy to have people speak, unmute and say the question. Um, but it was a comment about um, had a client say, "Do you really parent like this? I call this Caucasian parenting, and it's hard to change that mindset of thinking yes. that a democratic way is kind of like a, a Caucasian way." of parenting. Um, yeah, and someone said, I, I agree, because people of color, it's not the same. Um, um, when you're absolutely get your name taken from you, you know, from your historical trauma, mm -hmm. and the money you spend and have images of someone totally different than you, like white men, how damaging that is. Mm -hmm. um, I want my people to be healed and helped and for mm -hmm. all people to understand the impact of these traumas. So this is all really, really good. So let me, uh, let me just comment on that. Thank you so much. And so, yeah, this question comes up, right? So yeah. again, the resources that uh, were used are from people of, of color, right? And, you know, I like to say that I think everybody has a color, but uh, it's from people of color. And also it's, different parenting styles, we're talking about being assertive and building on what you want to see, right? So if you want to see children that are activists, right, for social change, how do you have to be as a parent, right? So maybe think about that in, in that way too. And how can you empower your child in today, right? So um, some of these concepts, are uh, seen like one ethnicity, but a lot of them are universal, right? And so um, again, the resources that we had are of people of different ethnicities. And this research is uh, global. You know, it's not just in one particular area or one part of the world, it's global. It could look different in different um, cultures, but the research is uh, global and definitely can impact people of every ethnicity, right? Mm -hmm. So thank you. thank you. And we know so much more now about um, brain development and the impact of, of different kinds of body physiological things that happen for children to be able to learn and grow and all of that. Um, and then um, someone asked about a parenting curriculum for people of color. Mm. I, I, and I, there is, there are groups that do what's called Afrocentric parenting. I mm -hmm. don't know much mm -hmm. about it, but um, yeah. Chantal, what do you know about mm -hmm. that? Right, and so that comes up a lot of uh, different um, parenting curriculum, like which one is best. And there's yeah. a lot out there. Yeah, we talked and I about say, that. yeah, explore, pick and choose, because mm -hmm. there's strengths you can derive from all um, parenting curriculums, and there's aspects that you can leave. You know, mm -hmm. so what focusing on what we're focusing today is you have that choice, right? Mm -hmm. That's the main point I want to get. There are different styles of parenting. You are the one as a parent who can decide what's best based on your child, mm -hmm. your background, what you would like to see. But the main thing, even if you're in a household, let's say there's two different concepts of parenting, 
right? Mm -hmm. A way to kind of meet is, what do you want to see in your child? What do you hope? And what are the abilities, characteristics of your child, their preferences? What's the environment, right? Mm -hmm. So again, coming together, um, we might not be on, you know, if you have two different types of parenting styles, you might not be on the same page, but at least be in the same book, mm -hmm. right? So again, keeping that in mind. And there's um, one of the references, uh, Julie Lykoth Hames. Um, she wrote a book called Ra How to Raise an Adult. And she's in your references. She's a, a person of um, African descent. And she is, um, she was, a, a, I think, a dean in a school. And this, she wrote her book based on what she saw and gave a lot of information for the helicopter type parenting, as well as the other parenting styles. But definitely um, the information we got is, it's, it's almost like, um, I, I don't wanna say that the cat's out of the bag, but the cat's out of the bag. You know, people are have access to all, you know, to parenting views and thoughts. And now we do have, we can have these conversations and really choose. Right. Whereas before, maybe it was cycle, generational, this is what we do. But now we do have chooses, uh, choices, especially with all the information available. So I encourage for yourself and especially for your, your clients to continue to seek information. Right. And, in, and you can take that into your style. Oh, I can't hear you, Beth. If anybody wants to unmute um, and ask a question, that would be totally fine um, to unmute. There's all really good comments people made. Um, you know, Abriendo Puertas is uh -huh. a curriculum that I know you're trained in, Chantal. Uh -huh. Right. Um, so that's, that's a, another one. And I see, Debbie, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, I just uh, had a question. You know, there's, um, I work with some families um, where the child is autistic and then mm -hmm. some may have like ADHD mm -hmm. and have just been diagnosed. So my question is um, with the different parenting styles, I know parents can adjust, but I know they become frustrated. Some want to, you know, they'll show a little bit of the author authoritative mm -hmm. uh, parent. So my thing is, how could we support these families with their children? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So, you know, again, there's so many different kinds of special needs. So the main thing is, you know, things might have to change. They might have to be a lot more flexible in their parenting based on the, your child's ability, based on, again, medications, appointments, right? So, but also everybody has a, the same chance of you know growing up. So what kind of adult do they want to see, right? And pour that in to their child. So again, it might look different. So there's some universal hopes and dreams that I said that parents might have, but it could look different in different communities around the world, right? So you might, parents want their children to be successful so what does that mean? If someone with special needs, does it mean um, when they grow up, keeping their schedules, their appointments, getting their medications, making sure they're going and getting therapy, right? Whatever they might need. So that might have the same theme, but look different according to what the child might need, right? So you might demonstrate more, you know, this is how you keep track of your appointments. You might have one of those pill cases in case you have to take medication. This is how you sort out your meds. So it might look different how you empower based on what your child might need, right? Or someone that might have um, okay. you know, ADD, a lot of energy, maybe show them how to expend that energy in a positive way. If they have to be cooped up um, when they grow up in, you know, in school, let's say, maybe showing them, hey, let's go to the park first and get some of that energy out, right? 
or this is how um, making sure that there's access for you if you might be um, in a wheelchair, let's say, this is how you get access, make sure there's access and make sure your rights are being upheld, right? So there's different ways that you can empower your child based on what they need. That answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. That was That's very a good helpful. question, thank you. Thank you, that's a great question. We've got about a minute left. Any other burning questions out there? Um, I feel free to unmute, um, but otherwise we'll, we'll, we do our usual thing where we'll invite you to click on the little leave button. Well, first we're gonna thank Dr. Thank Chantal. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so, so much. much. Yes, thank we're going to thank her so much. And I invite you to click the little red leave button in the bottom right-hand corner of your, of your thanks, Jacqueline. Thank you all for being here so much. And um, please fill out the evaluation. We need your feedback so we know what else you want to know, what other kinds of trainers. If you know of a trainer that you feel like you want to hear from, let us know. That really helps us a lot. Um, and thank you so much, Chantal. We just appreciate you oh, so much you. for being thank here. You. Thank you. And look forward to more. And there's uh, also some handouts too. So people might Yes, the that. handouts are in the resource, and we'll be sure we want to we're gonna regroup in just a couple minutes after everyone goes to make sure we have all the handouts that we want to okay. send to you, you today. Thank so you. um Thank you everyone for being here. Happy Friday Eve. Have a good weekend. <laughs> ah, we're yes. almost there. <laughs> Thank and, um, you. Thank we'll you. see you later. We'll, and for those of you that need a little help leaving, we will um, help you leave and uh, we'll have a little debrief at the end. So thank you again for the training and we'll see you next time.